Hi everyone, I hope you are well today indeed. This is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. What an awesome moment in time that God has given us to read through his holy word that we may discover and understand his persona, that we may understand and discover his will concerning our day to day living. And today we're going to look through the book of the gospel, Matthew chapter number 13 and chapters number 15. Why don't you begin with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, our great and awesome God you are. Our hearts are elevated, our hearts are excited, our hearts are open to receive from you today. We are so happy, just King of Glory, to have this moment and opportunity to read it through your word, through the person of your of your disciple, uh, you know, Matthew, as he writes and speaks to us in chapters 13 and chapters 15 of his uh, literature. And so, King of Glory, as we pray, let your word come forth alive in us. Continue to instruct us concerning your ways. The King of Glory, we may understand your will, your purpose, and your agenda in our day-to-day -day living for God. We want to live such lives that bring glory and honor to your holy name. In Jesus' name we do trust, pray, and believe. Amen. Chapter number 13, verses 1, the Bible says, On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, a saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and immediately sprang up at, because they had no depths of earth. No, no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away, and some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good grounds and yielded a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. He also, uh, he, he who has hears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples came, came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? So they understood that Jesus Christ spoke to others in parables, but not to them. They answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of, all, of heaven. That it has been given to you and not to them to understand the kingdom, the, the, the things of the kingdom of heaven. But not to them. It has, uh, it has, it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. To whoever has the desire to know the kingdom of God, to more will be given. To whoever desires to receive the knowledge and understanding of the kingdom of heaven will be given more, uh, will be given. And he will have abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because a sin they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand, he says, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, meaning you may have the ability to hear, but lack the ability to comprehend or to understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. Why? Because they have intentionally done what? Their, heart, their hearts of these people have intentionally grown dull. They are no longer excited with the word that comes forth. The ears, the ears are hard of hearing, and the eyes have they have closed lest they should see their ears, lest they should see with their ears, with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should do what? Heal them. He says, this is what, they have made a conspiracy, a conscious decision to hear but not understand, to see but not perceive, lest they do so, lest they hear and perceive, lest they hear and understand or, or see and perceive, lest I bring healing. What, what is the healing here Christ is talking about? The healing from sin, the healing 
you know, from, uh, from, from a sinful lifestyle. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. I pray that all of us can become like that. Blessed are you when your eyes can literally see what the word, God, the word of God is saying concerning your life, the transformation that God wants to bring, that you can perceive it through your spiritual eyes, through your inner man. You know, your, the Bible says that your spirit is the candle of the Lord. It is your spirit that God communicates to, the ability to perceive what God is saying and see the essence that lies there for, for in his word that can bring transformation in your life. For surely I say to you, verse 17, that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Verse 18, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. In other words, if you don't have any interest, if your heart is conditioned in such a manner that it does not receive the word of God with, uh, you know, with, with, with interest, with, with this eagerness, that the e wicked one comes and snatches away. Why? Lest you heart change your heart and receive the word that can bring transformation in your life. This is he who receives a seed by the wayside, but he who receives the seed on stony places, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Then what happens? Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the sake of the word, not because just because of Christ, but because of the sake of the word, what happens? He immediately he stumbles. Now, he says the second group of people is this. They receive the word of God with gladness every Sunday, every day, even through the Bible marathon. You receive the word of God. You are happy. You are joyful that finally God has spoken to you. But you don't meditate upon this word. You don't let it find a resting place in your, in your, in, in, in your heart. So what happens when persecution comes for the sake of that one, because every word you receive must be done, what must be tasted. So when the word is being tested, you let it go. Now, verses 22, he who receives a seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and cares of this world, the deceitfulness of what? Of riches. Choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So this person, like the second one, receives the word of God with joy. Mm. It finds a resting place. But the cares of this world, the deceit of riches, the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of honor, the pursuit of the trends of the world, they choke the word and make it unfruitful. Now these two, these two, is, is, is the example of the current believers because the greatest percentage lies here. If you don't see great transformation, yet people are flocking in churches, it is because they don't allow the depth of God word find a resting place in their hearts. Or number two, the deceitfulness of the pursuits of the things of the world has encompassed them, has robbed them the ability to allow the seed which is the word of God, bear fruit over their lives. 23, but he who receives seed on the good ground, is he who hears the word, does what? Understand it and indeed bears fruit and produces. In other words, this is the person who hears the word of God and works it out. This is the person who receives the word of God, understands it and knows what it is takes to labor, to put into practice the word of God, that it may bear fruit in his life. So which one are you? Are you the one who receives the word of God with joy, does not find the depths in it, the enemy 
you know, takes it away? Or are you the one who receives the word of God with joy? But the fortunes of this world, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, you know, choke that word that you immediately forget about what God says and you start pursuing the things of the world. Or are you good soil that you receive God's word? You understand it. You labor through grace to make the word of God find effect and produce after its kind in your life in, in regards to how you live, how you talk, how you execute things in your life. I pray that all of us shall become the good soil, that we receive the word of God, understand it, work it out, and let it produce a harvest 30, 60, 100 fold for the glory and the honor of his holy name. Chapter verses 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field, but while men slept, underline that, but when men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. One of the things that you need to understand here is that whenever you receive God's word, watch over it. God watches over his word, but also watch over it. Make sure you're praying for that word to be fulfilled in your life. You're praying for that word, you know, to be activated in, in, in your life. And you're praying even against, you know, the enemy snatching that word uh, from you, that you may live in such a way that you're working and working out God's word each and every day, that it may produce a fruit in your life. Now he says, this that when men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seeds in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. An enemy has done what? This. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. And then he says, he says this, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed and in, in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it was grown, it is, uh, it is greater than the herbs and, because, and, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. The kingdom also spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like living, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all living. So these parables of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is talking about, it's talking about the kingdom of God and is talking about the growth in the kingdom. The first parable, you know, uh, that we've read about the, the, the wheat and the tares, it talks about the sun and we, sh we shall look at it as we go on. It talks about the sons of God, the people of, who are righteous, the born again believers. You know, the seed has been sown of, gray, of born again believers here on earth. And in the same manner as time goes by, the enemy also raises his own people and born both of them are growing together. And you know, the servants who are going to harvest this are the angels. We shall look at it as we go on. The sons who come into harvest are the angels. And so Christ says, no. The master says, don't go now. Because you may uproot the tares together with the, with the wheat. So he says, wait until the day of the harvest. Wait until the end. Where, where we shall see the differences. Why? Because the wheat at some point, it will look like the tares and the tares will look like the wheat. But as they continue to mature, there shall be distinction. As they begin to bear fruit, there shall be a distinction. So the fruit of the believer and the fruit of the unbeliever or the person who has been sown by the enemy, their fruit will be different. Like right now, the believers are raising up. Also, the, the enemy is bringing in new agendas of murder, of, you know, uh, misrepresentation in terms of, of, of sexual orientations, the likes of the LGBTQ and, 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 and the rest. So let them grow up. But at the end of the day will come that the sons of God will show their fruit and the sons of the enemy will also share their, show their fruit. And then the angels will be called forth to harvest. 
and the story of the kingdom, you know, the seed and the and the uh, and the living. He talks about growth. That the kingdom of God will continue to grow regardless of what the enemy will try to bring about. The kingdom of God is mandated to grow no matter the obstacles. That's why Christ says, I will build my church and the gates of heads shall not prevail. The kingdom of God, once it has been established, it will continue to grow throughout the generations. God will always have a remnant when all is said and done. Verses 34, all these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables and without a parable, he did not speak to them that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept a secret from the foundations of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was a full, they drew to show and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire, where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, Jesus said to them, have you understood all these uh, things? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he said to them, therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a, is like a householder who brings out of his uh, treasures things new and old. So he says, number one, the kingdom of God is like a hidden treasure that a man found, went and sold it, sold everything that he had because he had joy that he had found this treasure. Meaning that no matter what cost it takes for you to get the kingdom of God, get it. If it means losing friends, if it means, you know, losing loved ones, if it means losing fame, if it means losing, you know, uh, 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 your place in the society, it does not compare to anything like just receiving that kingdom of heaven. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who, who found out, you know, a beautiful pearl and he went, found a pearl of great price and he went, sold all that he had and bought it, meaning the kingdom of God is better than any possessions that you can ever have. Why? Because it stretches beyond your current life here on earth to the life beyond. So Christ is saying you cannot compare getting the kingdom of God to any valuable thing in this world. And when all is said and done, you know, the wicked, you know, will be thrown away into hell fire. And those who are righteous will again continue living with their heavenly father. You know, Christ now is slowly teaching his disciples about what we call the scatological days, the end of things, the end of 
time and is making them understand, even as he's about to release them to ministry, the kind of mindset they need to have and carry around as they do the work of ministry. You know, ministry is done in the light and revelation of the last days. If you want your ministry to stand, understand this, that one day, you know, you will stand before your heavenly father and what you have done will be gauged and judged, you know, accordingly. You know, when all is said and done. So Christ wants these people, as they continue to do ministry, to have the end in mind. So that they may do a ministry that they understand very well. It shall be judged before the living God. Verses 53. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogues so that they were astonished and, say, and they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? And this, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not we all with us? Where then did this man get all these uh, things? So they were offended at him. Now listen. They're astonished and offended. Astonished and offended. One, they're astonished because they don't understand. This guy we know, they, we know his background, but look at his authority. Look at the works that he's displayed. Yet we know his mother. Yet we know his father, his brothers and sisters. What kind of man of man is this? So they move from being astonished and then familiarity breathes in. And guess what? They now start getting offended of him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not with his prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Ha, now he did not do any mighty works there because of their unbelief, the spirit of unbelief that is brewed by you know what we call familiarity. Chapter 14 verses 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. And therefore, these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his, brothers, his brother Philip's wife. Because John said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted John or him as a prophet. But when Herod, Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore, he promised with an oath to give her whatever he might ask. So she, having been promoted by her uh, prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and John he sent and John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the guard. She brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. So when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, heard it they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion again for them. And he healed their sick. Their sick when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place. The hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. Give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring, the, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and two fish and looked up to heaven. And he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to his disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes, verses 20. So they all ate and they were filled and they took 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. 
Now, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and uh, children. Now, Herodias, um, Herod the Tetrarch hears about the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, is astonished because of the miracles that Jesus Christ is doing here and there. And so he says, this must be John the Baptist who has come back to life again because it must be operating in his spirit because Herod know, knew very well that, you know, he had commanded John to be beheaded uh, as we have read. And so he's astonished because of what Christ is doing here and about. But as the days go by, you know, Herod is like, I know I ordered John the Baptist to be killed, but this man called Jesus Christ too easy. And the story goes by, you know, we are told about how the death of John the Baptist came to be and how his disciples took his body and went to bury him and took the message to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ feeling a deep sense of loss, he decides, let me separate myself and just go to a place because it's normal, you know, uh, that um, your cousin, first hand cousin is dead and is the one who prepared the way uh, for you. So he goes to this uh, secluded place and all of a sudden when he thought he's going to have time for himself, the multitudes follow him. And this is what we learn about Christ. You know, he, he has this personal sense of loss that he has lost John the Baptist, but again he sees the multitudes coming and he does not push them away because he knows it is my assignment to minister to them. And every man of God, there are moments that you'll be called upon to forsake your personal, you know, things and even thought they need to be taken care of and begin to focus on the assignment that God has given you. It has happened to me several, in, in several ways. You know, mostly when I lost uh, my, my biological father. You know, God wants you to work and to do his work. And there are moments that will have to put down that sense of remorse, that sense of pain, that sense of loss, and focus on what God wants you to do. And so from there we see that Christ, you know, responded to this multitude. He healed the sick and he continued to minister to them until the evening comes and the disciples tell him, oh, oh Lord, let these people just go because I've been with us here for long and you don't have anything to feed them. And Christ multiplies the bread and the fish and he feeds them. And what happens next in verses 20 is that they take 12 baskets uh, full uh, you know, of, um, of, 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 of the leftovers and we understand that in the ministry of Christ, there was no wastage. Christ practiced actually what we called frugality. And so he does not let everything go to waste. He says, pick those baskets, you know, pick, pick, pick whatever is left over. And they counted them and they were 12 baskets uh, full of the fragments that remained. Now, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and uh, children. Verses 22. Immediately, Jesus made. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Well, he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to do what? To pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves of the wind. Uh, of the wind, uh, for the wind was contrary. So here we see that Christ, after ministering to the people, he sends his disciple, the people away. He sends his disciples on a boat and he goes to a secluded place uh, to pray. Why? Because ministry demands constant union with the one who sent you. Christ did not want just to do ministry. You know, for the sake of doing ministry, he wanted to be acquainted with the one that sent him. And that's why prayer is so, so, so important. Whenever you have ministered, take some time to spend in the presence of God. Rest, spend some time in the presence of God. Rest, spend some time praying and waiting on God. Verses 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out of fear. But immediately 
Jesus spoke to them why Christ does not allow fear to find entry anywhere around him. So he spoke to me. You would have said, let me surprise them. Let them continue to be afraid and then I will poo, appear and they will know it is I. He said, the Bible says, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Christ did not tolerate any sense of fear to be amongst his disciples. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, oh Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, Peter and the disciples see, is it a ghost? It is a ghost. Jesus Christ says, do not be afraid. Peter says, Lord, is it you? Yeah. Then bid me to come. He says, come. He receives that word. Then one of the disciples have, would have taken it. But, Christ, but Peter says, let me come. If it is you, bid me to come. Christ says, come. And he begins to walk or not. He experiences the miracle of, of floating where he, will, where he would have sunk. But as he walks, the, it notices that there is a boisterous wind. So his focus ceases to be on Christ and the word that he said, come, and he begins to focus on the boisterous wind or the, or the wind that is coming against him. So what happens when the focus of Peter shifts from what Christ says and from Christ himself, he begins to seek. And then something interesting happens. He cries out to the Lord, says, Lord, save me. And the Bible says, verses 1, that immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O ye of little faith, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Immediately, he says, when he cried, Christ responded to him, may your prayers be heard today. When you're going through what you're going through today, perhaps God spoke to you something concerning your life, your business, your marriage, your family, your destiny. And it seems as if the circumstances around you are drowning you. It seems as if what God said to you will not come to accomplishment. I want to urge you, call unto him, call unto him. He hears and he will save you. And when they went down to the boat, guess what? The wind ceased. He did not even command the wind to cease. They just ceased. As long as Peter was back on the boat, the wind ceased. Why? Because the winds come to test what God has spoken over your life. As long as God has not spoken and you are in the boat, everything is safe. No wind is blowing, oh. But when God speaks and you start working out the word that he has commanded you to work out, the winds will come, situations will arise, circumstances will start creating themselves so that they can create doubt on what God has said about your life. Don't fall to that trick. Stay on God's word. That's why prayer is important. Whenever God has spoken something to you, bake it in prayer. Bake it in prayer, bake it in prayer, bake it in prayer that you may not notice the winds that are blowing near you. 33. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Verses 34. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, and when the men of that place recognized who? Him, Christ Jesus, they sent out into all that surrounding region and brought to him all who were sick and just begged Christ. What did they beg Christ? They begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment and, and as many as, a, as touched it, they were made perfectly well. You know, in... Is it yesterday, the day before, the day before yesterday, when we read about the woman with the issue of blood? Yeah. That's Matthew chapter 9, verses 20. When we read about the woman with the issue of blood, you see, the Bible gives us such an account about this woman with the issue of blood because her story number one was unique. And then the conversation of faith that she had between herself. 
That's what makes her unique. But when we read the verses 33 to verses 36, we discover she's not the only one who touched the hem of the Lord Jesus Christ and got healed. The hem of the garment of the Lord Jesus Christ and got healed. There were many here in Gennesaret. Many were brought and they were just requested just to touch the hem, just touch the hem of the garment. And they got healed. What makes the woman of the issue of blood, you know, so outstanding is that the conversation she had, it was a conversation of faith between herself and her situation. And the fact that Christ noticed her, Christ noticed that somebody had touched her, had touched him, sorry, and that power had, you know, oozed from him. When you come out to read the story, from a different, different perspective in the coming days, you shall, you shall see it. The conversation that she had. And she's the first one who told herself, if I can only touch the hem of his garment. Then the others here, they discover that there is a woman who did something unique out of a move of faith. And she received her healing. And so they bring these people who are sick that they may just touch the hem of the garment of Christ. And when they did that, many of them received their healing. Right now you don't have the hem of the garment to touch, but you still have got faith. Are you sick in your body? I call you. May you respond in faith. Let the Lord Jesus Christ, who bore your iniquities, who died on the cross, who was stripped naked, who was given stripes on his back, that you may be healed, is still the same one. And all you need to do is to touch the hem of his garment, not physically, but through the works of faith. The hem of his garment right now is his word. Trust in what he says, that God wants you well and respond to him in faith and you shall be healed as well as these people who are healed. May you receive your healing today as you respond in faith in the name of Jesus Christ and may you walk in testimony as you rebuke that sickness, that disease that is in your life. May you receive healing and may you have a testimony. May you receive healing from that blood pressure. May you receive healing from that diabetes. May you receive healing from that cancer. May you receive healing from that back pain. May you receive healing from that toothache. May you receive healing from that stomach. May you receive healing from that broken bone in your body today. May you receive healing from that tumor in the name of Jesus Christ. All you need is just faith in him and it shall be well with you in the name of Jesus Christ. We've come to the end of our reading today. Tomorrow we are looking at uh, the book of Matthew chapter number 15 uh, all through to chapters number 17. Read in advance and let the Lord uh, speak over your life. See you tomorrow. Shalom.